So welcome to the Nomadic Network. Um, it's We are a community of travelers founded by Nomadic Matt. Uh, so I work for Nomadic Matt and then the Nomadic Network is the community. So we started it in 2019 with the plan of hosting in-person events, but as you all know, the world kind of had some other plans for us in 2020. So we kind of shifted to doing virtual events, but then it ends up working out super well because now we've had over 250 virtual events and now we're back to doing in-person events and virtual events. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can connect with people in your local area and then you can also um, learn from experts that are all over the world to our virtual events. And we also have a monthly book club, which is also virtual. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Definitely check out. We just put together a brand new website, the nomadicnetwork.com. There's a forum to connect with other pers people. You can see all the events there and everything. Um, these are just some of our events that we've had. We're really back in full swing with the in-person events. There's a lot going on. So check that out to see if there's anything happening uh, near you. So connect uh, with the Nomadic Network through all of the ways, Instagram, TikTok, all of our events, group tours. We're doing a ton of group tours next year. I am personally going on the one in Costa Rica, and I am super excited and would love to have everyone join me. Um, one of my team members is in Morocco on our tour over there right now. So it's just we're super excited about our tour. So definitely check those out as well. Um, some quick reminders before we get started. Please, we love when you keep your video on. I know presenters love to see your lovely faces. Since we are virtual, it is really helpful to see how many other people are out there listening and um, learning. So keep your video on, but definitely uh, stay muted because you know we don't wanna distract um, our lovely presenter. So, but to, I know you're gonna have a lot of questions probably coming up or like comments. So like I said, feel free to use the chat. Um, just I'm going to be keeping track of all the questions so that Kathy can just focus on presenting. So just type in your question whenever they come up. Uh, I'll keep track of them. Just type question in all caps so that I can like really quickly like see it and then compile them. And then we'll have our Q&A at the end. Um, so yeah, that would just help me out a lot. So, and make sure I'll be also sharing ways to, and I'm sure Kathy will also share how to um, follow her so you can continue learning from her. She has so much to share, but it is a limited time. So uh, there's a lot of other stuff that she has um, to share. So that's pretty much it. Let me, um, for announcements, let me quickly introduce Kathy. So Kathy is a, Kathy Fulton is a fiber artist, travel blogger, and author of Dream Plan Travel Your Guide to Independent Travel on a Budget. So in 2017, at the age of 63, she set out on what was supposed to be a six-month trip, which included walking the Camino de Santiago, hiking in Scotland, and finding other knitters and spinners throughout Eastern Europe. 13 months later, she found herself in Estonia and still not ready to return home. I think we can definitely all relate to that one. I know I certainly can. Um, so yeah, so she continued east to Kyrgyzstan, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, South America, completing an around the world trip in two years instead of six months. So she's a, now a full-time nomad, is currently in the country of Georgia. In a couple of weeks, she plans to embark on a three month winter train journey from Kutazi, Georgia to Pamplona, Spain. We were just talking about that and before the call started and it sounds absolutely incredible. Um, I can't wait to follow along personally. So yeah, you can connect with her. I'll drop some links, uh, kathleensodyssey.com. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it from announcements. I will turn it over to Kathy and she is going to share all of her wonderful info with us. All right. Thank you. Thank Kathy. you, Sam. Thank you very much. I'm excited. Um, Although I was really surprised at how much interest there was in this topic, because it's not really like the sexiest thing <laughs> that uh, you do when you're planning your trips, having to do all the things that take care of your life at home. Um, in fact, many of these things are the things I just dread doing. I like the trip planning itself. Figuring out the logistics for home are not, is not so great. So the main things I'm going to cover today are like the logistics of getting ready for a long-term trip, whether it's 
a couple of months or two years. And mostly I'm going to be talking about the, getting things in order at home so you don't have to worry so much about them when you're gone. Um, all of these things are trip dependent and personal dependent. And you, I'll talk about that as we go along. But, you know, the longer the trip, the, the more difficult it is to keep things organized at home. So keep that in mind. And you're going to do things differently if you're going to be gone for two months than if you're going to be gone for a year. So keep that in mind. All these things are very flexible. So let me get the screen up here. Okay, you guys can see that now. Does that look good? You see a bunch of ducks? Okay, good. So um, here are the kind of the things that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. Let's see if I can get my, there you go. So I'm going to start out talking about the hardest thing is dealing with your home your, or your apartment. Um, and maybe equally hard is all your stuff. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about taking care of personal business like mail, bills, all that nitty gritty stuff that we really love to do day in and day out. Um, I also think it's important that we look at how healthy we are when we start out. And then that will kind of lead a little bit into uh, health insurance and travel insurance. I'm going to talk a little bit about your pets. I'm not an expert on pets, but I did get some information from some other people about that. And uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about safety on the road. And then I'm going to give you a ton of resources so that you can go and research more and more about some other things. I'm not going to talk about packing because that's something that varies so much from person to person. And it would that's just a whole nother presentation. Uh, many of these topics would be a whole nother presentation, but uh, I'm going to touch on them uh, as much as I can. And uh, certainly if I've missed something that you have been thinking about, oh, how am I going to handle that? I'll be glad to try to answer questions uh, as much as I can or refer you someplace uh, uh, to go to get the answers. Um, Throughout this presentation, you're probably going to come up with suggestions or tips or referrals that you've used in the past. And I really encourage you to put those in the chat. And uh, I'm going to glean those out of the chat later and we'll put it in a follow up email so that all you can be sharing the information, things you know that I don't know uh, with each other. Um, so that helps this to be a little bit more of an interactive event. So. Um, Keep in mind that, as I said earlier, that the shorter your trip is, the fewer inconveniences you're going to have back home to deal with. But if you're like I was, and I was planning a six-month trip, but then I kind of forgot to come home, uh, well, I can just really wish you luck because there were some issues that came about because I decided not to come home for so long. But I, you should also remember that you want to be prepared to be surprised. You may end up deciding that endless travel is not for you. You may get two months into it and go, forget it, I'm going home, that's okay. And you may be like me and then just stay longer than you had thought. So those kinds of things happen uh, and you can't, it's sometimes quite unpredictable. So let's get started with uh, your home. If I had a home like this, I probably would have a hard time leaving it. But uh, there are several options for you when you're talking about your home. A lot of us that travel nonstop, our first thing is sell it, get rid of it, get rid of all that property so you don't have to deal with it. But that's not for everyone. And a lot of people just aren't what aren't willing to return to their home. Maybe they're thinking that they're like, they're only going to be gone for a year and then they're going to come back and be, return to normal life. So, um, but uh, it is, and, and, and selling a house is a lot of work and it's probably not worth it unless you're going to be gone for a year or more. Um, and, and some people like prefer to own their own home. Some people have an attachment to their home. Uh, there's lots of reasons not to sell your home, but do consider it if you're, especially if you're considering a really long trip of a year or two. Um, the next thing, of course, is you can rent out your house or sublet your apartment. Um, there's lots of ways to go about doing that. Um, one thing is, of course, I'm not going to go into how to go about renting out your house, but I will tell you that my daughter and I found a really cool solution to her situation. She was only going to be gone for about three and a half months to meet me, but she really loved everything about her apartment. She, her landlords didn't want her to leave. 
And because it was kind of a short long-term trip, uh, she used a, a, a place called Furnished Finder. And this online service in the U.S. focuses on assisting basically mostly travel traveling healthcare workers, like traveling nurses. And they usually have contracts for three months at a time. And they are often looking for furnished homes to live in temporarily. So by default, these people have well-paying jobs and they have contracts that mean they'll probably stay their entire period uh, and they'll be able to pay their rent. And the nice thing about renting your home or your, uh, or your apartment furnished is you don't have as much stuff to store. Um, my daughter was able to put her personal belongings into a large closet and lock them and then leave the rest, all of her kitchen supplies, everything for people to use. It's almost like they came into an Airbnb. Um, however, in this case, if you're going to be long, gone for longer than three months, uh, you may have to keep finding new tenants every three months if you use a service like this. Whereas if you have someone to sign a lease, that's the, exactly the length of time you plan to be gone, then that's... Um, uh, maybe a better option for you. If I were going to rent out my house or sublet my apartment, I would probably figure out a way to have somebody manage that, like have, hire a property manager to do that, because then they can take care of all those little nitty gritty things that you don't want to have to be dealing with when you're so far away. Another option is to find a house sitter. Uh, and I have seen a few uh, presentations on house sitting, but mostly they kind of oriented toward you being the house sitter. Uh, but if, if it's on the other side of the coin, you're looking for someone to stay in your house. And this is really useful if you're going to be living, leaving pets. Um, you also can, uh, early on in your planning process, it's not a bad idea to uh, ask around in your community or your friends or relatives to see if you can find someone that you trust that might be looking for a place to stay long term. And then you can have some kind of agreement, maybe get part or all of the mortgage or, or the rent paid for you. Um, trusted house sitters is a pretty good, well, a lot of people comment that they have used trusted house sitters as a way to uh, both house sit and find a house sitter. Uh, I know that one couple that I knew who did a year-long RV road trip, they found somebody in the community that they already knew. They knew her very well, and they knew that the house would be intact when they got home. So uh, that is uh, one advantage to that, to finding someone that you already know. Another friend of mine who uh, she's gone regularly everywhere from three months to six months at a time. Uh, she has lodgers in her house all the time. She rents out a couple of rooms that she shares uh, the living space, the common area. And then she has these lodgers that she rents with, uh, rents to. Uh, and that's nice because uh, usually they're almost like family to her and she can leave the house easily. They know the ropes about the house. And uh, for her, it's worked really well because she can just leave when she wants to and not have to deal with quite so many things uh, about taking care of the house. Uh, what the last option I have is you can close the house up and it's the, probably the least, uh, recommended option. Uh, you could have a trusted friend check on it occasionally, but, uh, there's always the possibility when a house is left empty, there's a possibility of theft or vandalism. If you live way in the far North, you've got to remember that sometimes I've heard of nightmares of pipes freezing in the winter time. Um, and if you live anywhere, Consider that those critters are going to find out that you're gone really fast. We were only gone on a two-week vacation one time, and the mice set up housekeeping in our pantry, and it was a big mess. So keep those things in mind. A few other considerations that you might have, that I might have, I was going to throw out, um, is um, I did mention, I guess one of them was the, the property manager. Uh, I would certainly do that if I had a home that I was going to be renting out because I don't want to deal with, especially for a very long term. Um, and also, if you're going to hang on to the property and if you're going to be gone for a really long time, like over six months or so, it might not be a bad idea to have the property inspected kind of as if you were going to sell it just to see if there's anything that's about to go wrong uh, if there's some rot that you have don't know about that should be repaired, maybe the heat that is kind of on its last leg, the heating system, um, you then you could go ahead and get those kind of things fixed. Maybe it needs a new roof. You probably should do that because you don't want to have the roof leaking in the middle of your trip. Um, and your travel insurance may not repatriate you if the reason you're going home is because your house is uh, falling apart. 
So you might look at those things ahead of time. So the next thing I have on my list is dealing with your stuff. Now, let's face it, we all have too much stuff and we're all very attached to our stuff. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this topic, but I want to tell you that long-term travel will help provide the impetus for start getting you to start ridding yourself of a lot of things you really don't need. It's kind of like moving. Uh, for many years, I heard and I believe those people who always said, oh, downsizing, it's so freeing, but that doesn't mean it's easy to do. I understand that. Uh, each, each person has to decide how, how much you want to do. Uh, and for me, my downsizing evolved over the years. I sold my house first, and that was the easiest step. I got rid of a lot of stuff. Then over time, as my journeys got longer and longer, I'd get rid of more stuff every time I come back home. Now, everything I own is fits down to about a four by four pallet. This one I was leaving for Hawaii a few years ago. This was all my stuff. I, I And I brought it with me when I moved to Hawaii. And this is about what I still have. I think I have a little bit more than that right now, but I still feel like I have too much stuff. <laughs> so uh, there's a few things to think about when uh, you're talking about how much things, how many things to get rid of and what to do with them. Uh, one thing you want to do is you want to consider the cost. Uh, because if you're going to have, leave your things at home, you're going to have to store them. Um, if you rent your home or apartment, that of course means that you can probably leave most of the larger items in the home and rent the place furnished and then just store your personal and valuable things. But anytime you're going to put things in a storage locker, uh, that's going to cost you a monthly storage fees. And the smallest of those lockers, I think now are running anywhere from $90 to $100 and up. And that's not a lot of storage. You could put that, that stuff that's there on that pallet, you could put in the smallest storage locket. So it doesn't hold a lot of things. The other thing to deal with is your automobile. Um, again, uh, if you're going to be long gone for longer than six months, uh, unless you're really attached to your car, I'd suggest sell it and buy one when you get back home. Um, you, you can do the math, but if you think about what it costs to uh, continue the insurance, even if you bring your insurance down to its minimum, uh, the registration and any storage costs, plus, you know, dealing with where, who's going to, if somebody's going to take care of it, uh, it might be easier just to, to get another one when you come back. So it depends on the length of your trip, how, whether or not, and how attached you are to your car, if you want to hang on to it. But if you're going to hang on to it, remember that cars um, shouldn't be left driven for long periods of time. So you might want to consider loaning it out to someone that might be able to use it while you're gone. Uh, but definitely you want to get someone to start it up for you every once in a while. If it's just going to be left st stored uh, in, a, in, a, in a storage area or left in a garage, uh, you can probably reduce your insurance to the minimum uh, unless it's a very valuable car, of course. So check with your insurance agent to see what the recommendations are. My daughter was able to bring her insurance on her car down to its minimum um, while she was gone. If you are storing it, um, you want to learn how to prepare it for storage, uh, you can Google you know, maintenance for long-term auto storage, or you can talk to a mechanic, but there's certain things you should do so that that car will start uh, more readily start when you get home. Uh, the other thing to think about is if you're going to be absent from home when your car registration lapses, that's what we call in the United States, that's the car tags or your, your road tax that you have to pay. Um, and you can usually take care of that online, but a lot of people don't know that if you, in, in the United States, this works this way, I don't know about other countries, but you can take your car, in most states, you can take your car tags in and turn them in at the county, and then you don't, you won't have to re-register the car uh, and you won't be charged those extra months if you fail to register at the time that it needs to be registered. So you could save yourself some money, especially if you're going to be gone for quite a few months. So let's talk about taking care of business. And by this, I mean personal business, not your work or self-employment or anything like that. Uh, but uh, your own personal things. And I, you know, of course, right now it's gotten to be easier and easier to take care of that kind of business online. Um, and COVID has helped us all learn more about that, of course. But let's talk about a few things and a few issues that you're going to deal with. This is what, basically, this is what my mail looks like. So it's, you know, mostly junk we get in the hard copy mail these days. Um, so uh, one thing uh, 
you can do is you can sign up for paperless communication for as many accounts and services as possible. Uh, in the U.S., I know that the Postal Service will only hold your mail for 30 days, so that doesn't do you much good if you're um, a long-term traveler. Some people, and some of you out there may have used a virtual mailbox, this uh, service, a virtual mailbox service. Uh, this gives you a place where you can either have like a permanent physical mailing address or a virtual post office box that you can use as a permanent address for people uh, to send you physical mail or packages. Some places like your insurance, your health insurance, uh, uh, and uh, maybe your bank may require you to have a physical mailing address, not just a post office box. And this is some of these services allow you to have actually a street address to use uh, for your mailing address. So the services that these virtual mailbox companies can do is give you online mail notification. Uh, they can help you uh, view your envelopes and packages ahead of time. They can open and scan your contents of your mail. They offer mail forwarding services, and they, some of them have quite a few different other services they can provide for you. Um, let's see. I, I read an article that was very good about explaining this called, uh, it's Expert Vagabond wrote an article about uh, the different kinds of mailbox services and the ones that he recommended. Uh, if you have a favorite virtual mailbox company that you use, if you'll put it in the chat, we'll send it back out to people. In a minute, I'm going to talk about the way that I handle my mail. I don't use a virtual mailbox, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other thing, of course, is bills. And of course, like I don't have to tell most of you this, but most of us already handle our bills online. But if you don't, you want to be sure that you go through all of your bills, all your insurance, your your credit cards, uh, any loans you have, all those things, and make sure you're doing all that, doing all of that online. Um, you also, um, uh, if you have um, utility bills, ongoing utility bills at home because you're keeping your house, you want to be sure you're able to take care of that. And one thing it's easy to forget are, are some bills you may pay quarterly or annually. So you want to check on those. And do you have property taxes that maybe you're, you have to take care of and also your income taxes? Uh, you want to watch for those kinds of things um, while you're gone. The only pay bill that I have that I pay manually is my one credit card. And that's because that amount varies so much. I like to check it month to month, but everything else just gets automatically paid. And usually most of those things are charged to my card. Um, and then um, uh, I don't have too much to deal with uh, regarding bills. Um, banking, again, it's the same way. We're doing a lot of our banking online these days. My credit union is in Washington State, and I haven't been in Washington State in years. <laughs> so uh, I deal, I've been dealing with online banking for years. Um, but one thing you want to double check is uh, let your bank know that you're going to be traveling, if you're going to be in another country, that you're traveling and tell them what countries you're going to be in because my credit union requires this uh, still. More and more credit cards are not requiring it as much, but you definitely don't want to show up in a new country and go to the ATM and not be able to get any cash. So make sure all of that is lined up ahead of time. Also, if you receive any recurring payments that are uh, hard copy checks now, be sure to see if you can change those so that you're, they are automatically deposited into your account so that you don't have to have hard copy checks to deal with. A few other things, let's see, a few other things uh, that you want to talk, uh, take care of is uh, one thing that we should be doing all the time anyway is make sure your will is up to date. And I, there are a few documents that I recommend that you uh, leave with uh, someone that you at, back home or a family member or a good friend. Uh, you want to uh, leave a copy of your passport information page, uh, a copy of your traveler's insurance documents, and uh, personal instructions. These are all in case you have an emergency while you're gone. If you have somebody back home that uh, it is familiar with your travel insurance, so they know that say that you're incapacitated and you are not able to make decisions and they have to make a decision, help make decisions for you. Uh, if they have access to your travel insurance company, they can access them themselves and help get your help 
be part of the team to get help for you. Uh, also, if they have your passport information page uh, and they have to go to the, in our, in our country, it'd be the State Department to find out about you if they missed, haven't heard from you in three months or something, um, then they would have that information that, that the State Department or whatever your country's equivalent is to get uh, to try to try to track you down. If you're going to drive in another country, many countries require that you have a learning uh, a driver's permit for that country or an international driver's license. Um, you can uh, Google international driving permit and your country name so that you can see how to order an international driver's license from the country you're in. In the United States, actually, AAA is the people that manage that for us if you need to do that. So taking care of business, the way that I do most of my business, I am very lucky, is I have what I call your personal assistance at home. Um, and I can do this because I'm very lucky. I have a sister and a daughter who are both very organized and they're very diligent about watching, especially checking my mail and alerting me to any issues that they come across. So I use their two addresses. I use uh, one of them for certain things and another one for other things uh, as, as my home address, my home address, because I don't really have a home address. Um, so early in your planning, you might find a, a friend or a relative that you trust and is willing to help you take care of things like uh, sorting your mail, uh, receiving any items or boxes that you send home uh, and send items to you if you think of things like that. Um, they can also do things like make bank deposits. So if there are this one-off hard copy check you get, like I just got two during this trip because interestingly enough, my travel insurance company, I had two claims and they don't do electronic deposits despite the fact it's a travel insurance company. So they sent hard copy checks to my sister and she was very glad to send them on to my credit union. Um, so keep in mind that you do might get those hard copy checks every once in a while and it, you don't want them bouncing across the world to you and you bouncing them back to your uh, uh, to your bank. I also recommend, and I just do this for my general living because I'm solo person, I'm single person, and uh, it might be a good idea to have someone that has, uh, act, uh, let's see, let me, I guess I don't have, okay, let me back up here, back up to banking. Uh, I recommend that you have someone that has a joint account who has uh, on your, our signature authority on your checking account. Uh, this uh, obviously is going to be someone that you really trust, but um they can that way if again if you're incapacitated and they need to have access to your funds so that they can make help help manage some of your business for you um that they have access to that this happened to me with a woman that i was good friends with i was actually her personal assistant uh, at home and uh, it came in very handy when she became very ill. I was able to access her funds and able to make continue to pay her bills and take care of things for her while she was gone, while she was ill. Um, and uh, the other thing that these people can do, uh, I know that paper checks aren't used very much anymore, but every once in a while you do have to send out a check, uh, and that person would be able to do that because they'd be able to sign the check. Um, they could also have access to your storage unit. Uh, in case anything happens, a few years ago, my daughter's storage unit got broken into and she was able to call me and say, mom, would you go over there and check to see what kind of condition it's in? Uh, and also they can get things out of your storage unit if they're not buried in the back, maybe, uh, and send them to you if you decide you need something from there. Um, and of course, these people are going to be an, a good emergency contact. Generally, it's someone that you know pretty well. So if you're lucky enough to know somebody like that, uh, start working with them early and get them set up so that they can help you uh, on, while you're gone. So we want to start our trip out healthy. So one of the first things uh, I did are, are a little about two months before the trip, I started making appointments with um, uh, my physician, any specialist that you might see, uh, your dentist, uh, tell your doctor where you're going uh, and ask for a travel consult. Uh, they'll, uh, that Your doctor can go over any recommended immunizations and they can go over your prescriptions, help you get a, a, a supply of prescription medicine if you need it. 
uh, and you can talk to them about dealing with how to handle your prescriptions if you're going to be gone long term. Um, also, uh, and again, uh, immunizations, you can check with the Center for Disease Control's website and learn about any required immunizations for the countries you're going to, uh, as well as you can find out specific health issues that may be in those countries. I know that when I was going to Peru, I could specifically look to what parts of Peru uh, malaria was an issue so that I knew whether or not I needed to deal with that because I found out that not the entire country was like that. And it, I, it turned out I didn't have to deal with it at all. So uh, that is an excellent website to get information about um, health issues in other countries. Um, also, if you wear glasses, uh, have your eyes checked before you go and get a copy of your prescription to take with you. So if something happens to your glasses, you can have another pair made while you're gone. Uh, and I would also consider carrying an extra pair of glasses in case they get broken. Um, I just talked about prescriptions. Get copies of all paper copies uh, of all your prescriptions to take with you. Um, in many countries, you're going to find that you can just buy your prescription over the counter without actually having a prescription in hand. But um, you may need them in customs, especially if you're carrying a large supply of your your medication. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. On a completely another note, uh, I suggest that you train for your trip. You should get out and walk and run regularly, do yoga, stretching. Uh, you're going to be very active when you're traveling and you should practice carrying that, that loaded pack or uh, your rolly, drag your rolly bag around. Pack that rolly bag up and drag that rolly bag up bag around the block, especially maybe on a really bumpy street. So you can see what it feels like to have to carry that thing or roll it a few blocks. It takes a lot of effort. Oh, roll the thing uphill. Every time I have a new place to stay, it's uphill from the train station or the bus station. <laughs> so get yourself in shape. You want to be uh, ready to go and you don't want your back to go out the first time you lift the bag off of the luggage carousel. So let's just move right into a topic that would take about three hours if you really wanted to spend a lot of time talking about it. It could be a whole presentation on health insurance and travel insurance, and I'll differentiate these. Health insurance that you have at home that takes care of what you have when you're living at home, what your normal health insurance or your government program is for your health care. Um, but I'm going to talk, and also then you should have travel insurance. And I'm going to talk about why I think you need both. Some people don't get both, but I think that uh, if you're traveling outside your home country, you need both. And here's some of the reasons why. Um, it's unlikely that your health insurance or government health care program is going to cover you while you're out of your country. You'll need travel insurance for that. Alternatively, if your travel insurance covers repatriation for health care reasons, maybe you should have health, you should make sure that your travel uh, insurance does that. They're not going to cover your medical expenses once they get you back home. So you're going to need some kind of health care taking care of you at home. Um, if you have some kind of a family emergency or something like a pandemic that might happen or civil unrest, your home health insurance is not going to help get you home or take care of any issues around that. Uh, and also on the other side of the coin, uh, the travel insurance is probably not going to cover you for pre-existing conditions. So um, keep, in, keep those things in mind uh, and uh, talk to the per people that you get your home health insurance from and see what the uh, what uh, considerations you need for your own insurance. Um, so I want to give you some uh, considerations to think of. Oh, also, some countries, when you enter them, they may require that you carry some kind of medical insurance that would be valid in their country. Uh, and so you want to research that as well. So. Um, it's really important that you read the documentation of the travel insurance when you purchase it. 
uh, before you purchase it uh, to be sure you're getting the coverage you need and want. I recently changed my uh, my my travel insurance because I started reading the documents a little more carefully, and I was going to be coming. I thought I was going to be traveling to a some countries that were a little iffy, and I thought I want to be sure that I have repatriation in case I decide I really need to get out of that country. So. Uh, uh, read that. I found that the, the insurance I had, it was a little iffy whether or not they would send me home. So I changed to another insurance company. Um, if you've got some kind of adventure travel you're going to be doing, you may have to pay a little bit more for that. And you want to be sure your policies cover that. Also make sure that they cover long-term travel. Some companies will only cover you up to 30 days. So uh, uh, check on that. Um, the other thing that you want to be sure about your home health insurance or your government program is if it's going to be valid when you return. Um, some countries and or insurance country uh, companies require that you have some presence in your state, your county, your nation for a certain amount of time every few months. Uh, this can be a real challenge for long-term travelers. I was talking to a man recently from the Netherlands, and he said, yeah, I'm supposed to be in my country a certain amount of time, and he travels permanently. So it's a real issue. I don't have an answer to that, and I can't give you any advice, um, but just you need to be aware that um, your coverage uh, at home could lapse if you haven't shown that you've been there during a certain amount of time. I've never had that happen to me yet, but it is something that I realized could happen. And also remember that with uh, your travel insurance, you almost always get some kind of a concierge service uh, to help you find non-emergency medical and dental care. Uh, care. I've done that uh, and other kinds of assistance. I've used my concierge service more than I've actually made any claims with the companies because they're usually very helpful in finding a, an English speaking clinic uh, or physician. And I understand that some of them can even help you find, uh, they, they may not pay for legal uh, assistance, but they can use, maybe help you find legal assistance uh, in the country that you're uh, in. I want to say a note because I am in the Medicare uh, category of people. Uh, I want to speak to our retirees in the U.S. Medicare does not cover you outside the United States. If you have a Medicare Advantage plan, it may or it may not cover you. So you need to check your uh, requirements in your state, in your in your plan to make sure that you're covered out of the country. Uh, and more than likely, the coverage is going to be limited to just their emergencies. So the bottom line is you need both health insurance at home as well as a travel insurance coverage. Um, if you have good experience with any uh, travel insurance that you've uh, worked with in the past, put them, the name of that company in the chat box and we'll pass that along. And we're going to lose time now, so I'm going to quickly talk about pets. Uh, instead of me talking about pets, I'm going to refer you to a very good presentation that was done on the Nomadic Network a, few, a year or so ago by a woman named Candy Godoy. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, and uh, we're going to put this in the follow-up email so you don't have to write this down. But this was the, a link to the presentation. And she has a very good presentation on how to take your pets with you. And she also has an excellent website um, about traveling with pets. And I would just refer you to there, uh, to her, to learn more about that. I'm not a pet expert. But I did talk to a friend of mine who uh, has worked with animals all of her life, and she's worked in animal control. If you're going to leave them at home, first off, her reaction to that was, well, it's not really very affordable to board your animals for a long period of time. So your options are basically you can leave them with a friend or relative. You can have a house sitter that's going to take care of your pets for you, uh, uh, someone that, that you trust. Um, but the one, the other thing that she said from me, she says, in working with animal control for many years, she said that it's interesting how many people don't keep the microchip information in their pets updated. And so they find an animal and they contact the microchip company and the information is no longer any good. So make sure that information is updated uh, and that if you have a, a, a pet sitter, that they know the company that it's registered with so that uh, if something happens and your pet is lost or injured or whatever, uh, that they will be able to get in contact with you. 
Uh, if you have a house sitter or a, I'm sorry, a pet sitter, um, make sure that that person has written consent uh, uh, with them and also leave some written consent with your vet so that that person will have the ability to make emergency decisions for your pet if they can't contact you. So I'm going to move on to safety. Uh, I uh, I travel solo, so I carry clear identification on my body at, in the in the uh, guise of a bracelet, or you can also get these as dog tags or other forms. But this bracelet that I carry on myself all the time, 24-7, has some contact information on it in case I'm incapacitated and uh, the, the emergency personnel need to get hold of someone. Uh, this company, RoadID.com, is the uh, one that I use, and they also have a subscription service that you can pay for that where you can list information about yourself, medical conditions, emergency contacts, uh, passport information, anything that, uh, per, that uh, medics might need in the case of an emergency, um, and they can access that uh, just from information that's uh, hidden on the back of this bracelet. So um, I started using this because when I was swimming uh, a lot and I realized, oh, the lifeguards have no idea who I am and I don't have my driver's license on me when I'm swimming. So uh, these are really meant for people that do sports and do things alone a lot. Um, and especially if you're traveling solo, I think it's a good idea for you to carry something like that. Um, I'm not going to talk a great deal about VPNs because... Uh, I think most of us know about those, but that's a virtual private network. It's useful, uh, especially if you're doing uh, work online with, uh, say, banking or things like that online and you're in, in a uh, public, using a public Wi-Fi. Uh, you can hide your information and for anybody that might be trying to hack in and get, uh, get your credit card information, for example. Uh, I use um, Express uh, VPN uh, for my uh VPN uh, service. My bank requires that I show that it looks like I'm in the country. I'm actually logging in from the United States or they won't let me in to my, do my banking. So I use my virtual ne uh, private network for that. Uh, a side effect is that you can do things like stream Netflix because you can tell Netflix it looks like you're in the country that you're in. So um, there's a lot of information out there about VPNs if you need more information. Um, if you're in the United States, there's a program called the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. Uh, this is run by the State Department. You, if you're outside, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you might check with your own country to see if it has something like this. You can register with uh, the State Department in the U.S., let them know what countries you're going to be in. I regularly get emails for the countries that I'm in if there's uh, some kind of uh unrest going on or there's some issues going on in the country that I'm thinking about visiting. It makes you help make more informed travel uh, travel decisions. Uh, also, it also helps the embassy be able to contact you in an emergency. I noticed when I was actually I was home and I was still getting some emails and I noticed when they were for, they had provided some emergency uh, transport service out of Kyrgyzstan. I wasn't there at the time, but I got the emails for people during COVID had gotten stuck in Kyrgyzstan and they were providing that information and the emails were going out to everybody that was enrolled in this program. Uh, so those are some advantages to that uh, kind of program. Again, check if you're not a U.S. citizen, check in your country to see if you have something like that. So I can't cover everything in this. Let's see. So I'm going to give you some resources uh, to help you uh, with long-term, any kind of travel, but especially long-term travel. There are several blog posts that I have on my website. One is, um, I did promise in the description of this program that I would talk to you about how to streamline your first few days of travel. Uh, but because we're running out of time, um, I want to direct you to this blog post because this tells you what I do before I uh, go to a country, all the things I do so that when I hit the airport, I know where the where I'm going to get a taxi or where I'm going to get a bus. I know where the, I even checked to see where the ATMs are in the airport. I checked to see how I'm going to get to my lodging. Sometimes I even go on uh, Google Maps and do a Google Street View so I can see what that lodging street looks like. It helps me streamline my, and make it much easier. And I arrive in a strange country, uh, much more confident about 
that. So there's a lot of information in that blog about that. Uh, if you want to learn more about my version of long-term travel, I also have uh, this um, blog post that tells you, gives you a lot of information about long-term travel, helps you determine if you think you're You've never done any long-term travel before. It gives you some ways to think about whether or not it might be the thing for you. Uh, and there's some downloadable worksheets to help you make that decision as a part of that um, blog post. Um, and recently, uh, if you want to learn more about how I create a very lengthy itinerary, uh, I just recent uh, last year, I wrote a series of posts about how I planned my overland travel that I'm getting ready to take care of right now in a few weeks from I'm going from Georgia to Spain on a train. I've nicknamed this series. There's about six blog posts. It's called Look Over My Shoulder because I've often had people say, can I just see how you do your planning? I just want to look over your shoulder and see what you do for getting reservations and such. Uh, so this is a very detailed series. Um, there's lots and lots of links to booking resources. Um, and I have a lot of different kinds of documents and spreadsheets and calendars that I use to keep things organized. So if you're planning a long-term or a multi-country journey, this might be helpful in your travel planning. As was mentioned in the introduction, I've written a book called Dream Plan Travel. You can learn about how I travel slowly, long-term, and independently, and on a very tight budget. Right now, I'm uh, trending toward less than $1,000 a month for everything. So uh, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of stories and examples about how I travel. Um, it's full of links to downloadable enhanced content, um, pertinent blog posts and budgeting spreadsheets, things like that. You can learn more about the book uh, here at kathleensodyssey.com slash DPT. <laughs> um, and you can read there the uh, uh the introduction in advance and see the table of contents. Um, if you want to order the book, uh, uh, there's hard copies available, but you'll have to order them online or from your favorite bookstore. But uh, I've, I've got a special right now for people in this group. Uh, if you would like to order the ebook version, which is a PDF copy of the book, uh, you can get it for half price, which is $8, uh, and you can download it immediately. And here's the coupon code TNN-DUCKS. Um, and you're welcome to share that with your friends and family, but it, that coupon code is only good until November the 10th. So there you have it. Uh, you are ready to get your ducks in a row. I've gone over this really quickly, so I've tried to include as much information as possible. But uh, and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have. So let's see. I'll Thank unshare you so my much. I think I've got to figure out how to unshare my screen. Oh, here we go. Stop okay. share. There we go. Okay. Great. Oh my gosh. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was incredible. So much information. Wow. Everyone was just like popping off in the chat. So many questions, so many people like, like adding their information. So I'm definitely going to be um, sharing, uh, saving the chat at the end of this. Cause I know you mentioned you're going to want to send out an email with everyone else. Cause that's the whole point of this community is to learn from each other. So right. I love that. Thank you everyone who is sharing their advice. Um, and let's let's get to the questions because there were there were a number of questions, um, of course. So Sharon asks, do you maintain a home base while traveling? You kind of talked about that a little bit, but yeah, uh, it's basically my daughter's house. And that's kind of nice because she lives in New Orleans and that's a great place to go back to. Um, but I don't have a home that I go back to. I right now, if I were to go home, I would go and stay with her for a while until maybe she kicked me out. She's on here, I think. So she says, she says, oh, really? <laughs> but no, I would, we have lived together for a while in between trips. So uh, I do have a home base, but it's not really my home. It's my, my daughter's home. That's great. That's, that's awesome. Um, and so uh, talking, continuing to talk about uh, where to stay kind of thing, but on the road. So Will asks, how do you go about finding um, midterm rentals, like at least 30 days in new destinations. What do you use? Um, I use a lot. I use Airbnb a lot uh, because especially on um, 
on Airbnb, you can often find, um, uh, you can get uh, discounts if you're staying more than a month. And if discounts aren't, list, aren't listed for a place, I usually contact the host and say, would you give me a discount? I One time I stayed for a couple of months in Ecuador and I con- it, was on, it was a thing I found on booking, but it looked like the ideal place for me. And I contacted him and I said, I'm going to be staying a couple of months. And he said, and he gave me a really great discount that wasn't listed on booking. So uh, those are the two main ones that I use for. for yeah, term. I've done that as well. And sometimes if you pay them outside of the places, they'll uh, give you an even better rate if you're going to be staying like even longer. Um, right. Yeah. But yeah. okay. So uh, for the furnished sublets, like when you're talking to go back to talking about like renting out your own place, you were mentioning that website to that. I think you said your daughter used. Uh, yes. So for furnished sub t- sublets, can you line them up every three months for a year? Because you said they were they're mainly only for three months. Would that be I possible, or then would you? I don't think you can because a lot of times the people don't even know what their contracts are until maybe a few months before. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I did. You know, we found this because my daughter and I were looking for a long term furnished place to live, and that's how we found this place. We were looking for it for ourselves, so it's not limited to. Uh, medical personnel. So there may be people that are looking for long term and you can list, I think in, if you put your listing out there, you can list, I'm looking for someone to take a, take my lease for a year or something like that. So you can specify Mm -hmm. that if you're looking for that on that, on that furnished finder. I don't know about other ones similar to that. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's good to know. Um, All right. About health insurance. I know there was a lot going on in the chat about health insurance because it's such a <laughs> tricky subject in the U.S., unfortunately. Um, so you kind of did touch on this, uh, so, but someone had asked if you need to return to the U.S. Uh, sometimes for like a month or so, what do you do about that? Like what insurance do you use that covers you both abroad and the U.S.? I know Safety Wing does that. Someone else mentioned in the chat another one, but what have you come across? Yeah, I it's completely separate for me. I don't I know that there are I just recently actually part of doing this program, I noticed that there are some insurance companies that if you're just going to be back in the US for a short period of time, you can find insurance and I I know I use World Nomads mostly, so that I don't they don't. I don't pretty sure they don't, but um uh, I did notice that there were some. So if anybody knows of one that will um, cover you, if you go home for a short period of time, um, then you can uh, put that in the chat. Uh, I just, I'm not aware of which ones will do that. Yeah, I know Safety Wing, I think, does it for like 30 days or something, but you'd have to yeah. check. It depends. Um, right. But it's tr- so tricky. Health insurance is just so tricky, unfortunately. It is. Um, so and this tricky. is... This is the this is another one. Sorry, I know I'm like rapid fire going through these, but I want to like try to. Can, could you say like a couple minutes over if like we to finish oh, yeah, all the yeah. questions? I would okay, like to just one. I want to be conscious of everyone's time here. So, um, uh, so coming back to the U.S., this is another another one about that. But um, say you want to come back to for a short period of time, what do you do about a car? Like, do you rent a car? Do you lease a car? It sounds like maybe you don't need one in New Orleans, but um, what do you have? What is the solution you found for that one? Well, uh, when I was came back from my uh, trip, uh, some friends loaned us a car. But what happened to me after I'd been gone for two years? I'm not a very I'm a kind of a tentative driver anyway. And I was gone for two years and I didn't drive the whole time I was gone. When I got back, it was like two months before I would actually drive again. So I was actually taking the bus and walking a lot <laughs> or getting getting, you know, getting some, you know, getting, I, we used Uber some to get around, but, um, uh, so if I were gonna, when my, when actually my daughter, I didn't have a car at the time that COVID hit, I still hadn't had a car. I'd been back in the U S for like six months and I still didn't have a car and I was just kind of, you know, winging it. And, um, some people did loan us car, uh, temporarily part of the time we were, uh, I was there, my son had moved in with me for that period of time. Um, and, uh, but, uh, I, we did, I did end up buying a car cause COVID hit. And so temporarily my daughter and I bought a car together and we did a road trip around the U S and then, uh, then she actually got another car, uh, later of her own. And we sold. I sold it before I started traveling again. So, um, 
because I was in back in the U.S. for a longer period of time, unexpectedly, I did buy a car. But so that's how I did it. But it's kind of like if you, it depends on what your public transportation is like in the city that you're staying in, those kinds of things. Also, how much you really need a car. I got used to not using a car much. So that made a difference, too. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so a couple of people asked a very similar question, and I think um, you're probably going to say VPN, but a few people asked, how do you protect yourself when accessing your financial and banking websites while you're traveling? Have you had problems? Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for that one? That's that's where you need the VPN. Definitely need a VPN for that. Mm -hmm. And it's so yeah. the VPNs are so affordable. There's no yeah, reason not, not to get one. Yeah, they're yeah, not very exactly. expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Um about safety. Do you recommend carrying two wallets instead of one while traveling? And I guess largely, are there any particular safety tips that you have kind of incorporated? I have been extremely lucky. I got pickpocketed once in Arequipa, Peru, where pickpocketing is like a lifestyle. And I lost a whole like $7 US. So <laughs> I have been really, really fortunate. And I don't think I'm particularly careful. But I do if I have like, I've just gotten money out of the ATM, I will bury a large amount of that somewhere in the bottom of my pack so that it's not like, you know, like, on me. Uh, if And lately, I've been, the countries I've been to lately have been very safe, very comfortable. Georgia, I don't even lock my, my lodging house when I leave. It's so safe here. But if you're in places where there's pickpocketing is more, you know, in, uh, like when I was in Peru, oftentimes I carried a money pouch that was down, like stuck inside my clothes where I kept a lot of things. So it depends on the country that you're in. So definitely you need to be aware of that. I wouldn't do that here. I, I easily carry you know, even $100 worth of money out on the street here, I'm not worried. This is a very safe country. People, there's just no, there's practically no crime in this country. But in another country, I would be, a, I would really be different. So it depends on the country you're in. Definitely does. I will say we have an entire series on safety in, uh, on nomadic on nomadicmat.com on safety in different countries. So if for countries that people are concerned about, um, so if you're going to a specific place and you're like, oh, what's safety in Peru? We have an article on Peru. So, you know, yeah, check yeah. out, do a search in Nomadic Mat, and we have a ton of safety posts um, on, on going to all these different kinds of places. But you're right. It so does depend. But that's great to hear that Georgia is so safe. Another oh, reason I want to go there now. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, oh, someone asked about your book. Are there worksheets in the book? Oh, I guess maybe there's, you could tell us a little bit more about what's in your book. Okay, there's downloadable worksheets. There's a QR codes all through the book that you can just like click on or or links you can go to. You can actually click on the links, I think, in the ebook uh, and it'll take you to that downloadable enhanced content throughout the book. And then, and then there's also quite a few references to my different blog posts uh, so that you can find out more information that I didn't include in the book, did not include. There's a lot of photos in the book. And there's also, I tell several stories to illustrate different aspects of my travel. So, and you can look at the table of contents. You can see the things that I cover. Basically, it's a how I travel, what my travel style is, why I travel that way. Um, and so that that's what it's about. But you can definitely uh, read the introduction. You'll get an idea of what the book is about. Awesome. Um, so. People are some a lot of people are asking about mail. Uh, so like, do you receive mail like when you're abroad? Like you said, your your daughter um, takes care of stuff for you. Like, do you ever have to have her send you stuff? Like, do you get a post office box or just have it sent to your accommodation? I've never had a ha I've never had to have any hard copy anything sent to me. Uh, there have been a time or two my sister scanned something and sent it to me. Um, but really I've been able to take care of things, you know, remotely without, uh, actually having to have something sent. I did, I did lose a credit card one time. That was my fault. I lost it. And, uh, the credit card company FedExed it to me, like right then, like within a few days I had a credit card. So that's the only thing I think I've ever had sent to me like that. It's expensive to have things nice. sent over you know, across 
once you outside the once you get outside your country, it gets really expensive to have even the smallest things sent. So yeah, definitely. Um, okay, real quick, last uh, question that's just come in from Emily. She's asking about your budgeting. I think everyone is in awe of your budgeting in here, but she asks, how do you fund your travels for such a long period of time? Um, I'm right now, I, I have my only uh, income that I have is my social security. One of the reasons I travel to some of these countries is because I can live in these countries cheaper than I can live in the United States. And that's including in my, any airfare or transportation, my insurance, everything. I keep track of everything, everything that I spend on a spreadsheet. And so I can tell where the money's going. But basically the last three months, my average uh, spending, because I've been in Georgia my, and I haven't really gone anywhere like by air or anything. My average spending has been uh, right at around $800 a month. Um, so I think that I've been, you know, having come from the US, it's pretty incredible. So I'm well below my social security payment. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to Europe. So it's going to be more. I stay in hostels when I'm in uh, more expensive countries. I stay in hostels a lot. I stay in hostels here too, if I'm only going to be there for a few days, but I like a private room if I'm going to be longer term um, then. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I think I, I have a lot of um, stuff on my blog post about how I save money. Uh, I have a whole blog, uh, two, I think I have two blog posts written about how I save money when I travel. Uh, but a lot of things, I prepare a lot of my own foods. Um, I take local transportation, things like that. Cool. Okay. So a couple of people actually asked about holidays. Do you go home for the holidays? Uh, I'm assuming you don't go home for every holiday, but like major ones uh, or just do family come visit you? Like, what do you do about the holidays? Well, we I've never been a big holiday person. So for me, it hasn't been an issue at all. Uh, I'm going to be spending two Christmases this year. Uh, I'm going to be spending one Christmas in Kosovo, which is a Muslim country. So that way I'm away from the Christmas hubaloo. But then I want to go to Montenegro and be there for uh, the, the Orthodox Christmas, which is going to be January the 6th. So I get two Christmases this year, but that's very unusual for me. Uh, Christmases are, I mean, holidays are not a big thing for me, but I do have some friends who are traveling long term right now. They've been on the road now for, oh, four or five months, but they do have plans to go back to the United States so they can be with their family for Christmas. So it's a, it's, that's a personal thing for sure. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, I think I'll do one more. Uh, uh, I think I covered most people. So I'm sorry if I missed someone. It was like rapid fire for a second. But um, I will share links again to connect with Kathy. I'm sure you guys have so many more questions so you can ask her directly. Yes. But um, Laura asks, uh, how do you mainly spend your time? I know that's such a broad question. But, um, you know, given that you're on the road full time. Um, yeah. Well, I travel very slowly and I wrote a blog post about that, <laughs> but I travel very oh, slowly because when you travel long term, it's hard. You can't really be like on the you know two week European trip where you see five countries in six days. You're going to be slowing down quite a bit and you're going to have everyday life. You know, like the last few, week, a couple of weeks, I've been doing things like planning this next trip. Um, I have been uh, working on some knitting projects. Um, I like to read uh, and I also was working on this presentation. So I have a lot of things that keep me busy that are not necessarily just seeing sites. Um, and so I, uh, some people work when there are a lot of people, there's a lot of digital nomads these days. I'm running into them everywhere now. It, I think COVID just upped, ramped it up for, for being able to work online. Uh, of course, that's a whole nother presentation people can talk about, but I think it's wonderful that people can do that. Um, and so a lot of people are working. Uh, I was able to work part time when I first uh, started traveling. I was still working a little bit part time, not much, but a little bit while I was traveling. Um, so I, I do kind of everyday things because like, for example, I've been in this, I'll be a total in this guest house that I'm in right now for three weeks. Um, so I, and then I spend some time walking, going on walks because I'm, there's a forest really close by, beautiful walks here um, and, and then go see some of the sites on certain days, whatever I want to do. But then I don't, I'm not doing a lot of sightseeing um, when, um, 
uh, in some places where I've uh, gotten to know people better, I spend time, when I was in Sri Lanka for three months, I got to know um, a man there that we became really good friends. And I would go down and help him out in his cafe some, you know, so uh, there's a lot of things that you do. You have a lot more chance to get uh, meet local people and make friends. There's pros and cons to that because right now, as Sam and I were talking about before, you make all these friends because you're traveling long term, you're traveling slowly, you make friends, and then you want to go back and see them. And it becomes very expensive because you need to go back and see all these people that you've met all over the world. But it's a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> Exactly. So. It's a great, it's a great problem to have. Um, okay. I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up because we're well past the hour at this point. And I think we could just keep going, asking you questions and it's everyone. I will have you all know that it's four in the morning for Kathy and she is a champ for doing this Five right now, now <laughs> when it's convenient. Yeah. And it is uh, convenient for all of us. Um, so we'll let her go back to bed and um, Let's say one thing, I, uh, Sam. Let me say one yes. thing, please, please, please. Uh, I'm I'm on the net, network. You can message me there or you saw all these, you got all this other contact information. If you have more questions or your question didn't get answered, contact me. I'll do my best to answer it for you. Yes, I'm, I, I, I know I love fielding travel questions. I think everyone here does. We just, that's, that's the whole point of TNN is like, we want to yeah. share all of our unique travel knowledge. And you clearly have such a wealth of travel knowledge for traveling long-term on a budget. It's amazing. I can't wait to sh like follow your train journey. It's so inspiring. Um, so yeah, I am going to quickly um, give a, a few like ending announcements. Um just bear with me real quick. Where is this? Is Can everyone see my screen? Um, hold on. I can't even see my own screen. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> can you see my screen? We can see no? your screen, yes. but I don't think it's what you want us to see. It's not. It's not. But someone asked Someone asked if there's a group for long-term travelers. So that's why I was pulling up this link to share. So um, to connect with everyone, definitely like join uh, the Nomadic Network if you're not already. I'm assuming everyone here is, but go and like click around and check the groups because there's a ton of, um, we're just getting started with our new website. And there's a lot of like individual groups where you can really connect with people that are interested in the same things that you are. Um, so yes. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, this is what I did want to share, which is um, just quickly, I just wanted to say, like, we have a few more upcoming events. These are just the next ones that we have going on. I know Kathy is doing one in a few weeks on the Camino de Santiago, which I also did. It was an amazing experience. And I am undoubtedly sure that you're going to have such a detailed amount of knowledge to share with everyone about that. So uh, definitely check that out. These are like our upcoming ones. You can see we have a variety of different things. Then we have some in-person meetups. Um, we have our group tours. As I said, we're going to a ton of places, Morocco, Jordan, Costa Rica, Mexico, so many cool places. Check those out. Those are happening in the spring and fall because we like to do off-season travel too. As I know you do, Kathy, we were talking about that. Um, our book club this month is The Dogs of Nam with uh, director of content at the at Nomadic Matt, which is Christopher. He is an incredible writer, and I'm not just saying that because I work with him every day. His book is hilarious. I'm currently reading his novel. It's so good. That just came out. So definitely uh, join this month's book club if you're interested in some really hilarious travel stories. Um, and yeah, a lot of people did ask about replays. So we are recording this um, and I am going to save the chat. The replays are available for our TNN Plus members. Um, this event is totally free for everyone, but it takes a whole village to put on the Nomadic Network, which is free. So with uh, TNN Plus, you guys get access to all of our past events, this event, every future event, and it's uh, really affordable. So um, that's kind of like just how to give back and to help support the community because otherwise everything is absolutely free. So if you want those replays, definitely check out uh, TNN Plus. And um, yeah, I'm going to save the chat and that's, and then, well, that's pretty much it. Thanks everyone for being here. And thank you again so much to Kathy. That was amazing. Um, and be sure to connect with her everywhere and ask all your 
questions that I know everyone's going to be buzzing about after this. Um, so yeah, thank you, everyone. I'll just say bye. Thank you. Bye.